Welcome or welcome back. I'm Shannon Mix, historically inspired sewist by day, circus artist by night, and this week I'll be walking you through the process of sewing the black snail jumper dress. Now, this is the same pattern I used as the base for my Edwardian Miss Frizzle cosplay, which was a super fun and whimsical video, but this week I'll be walking through the construction process a bit more step by step for those of you who want to know more about the specific details of the pattern and learn how it goes together. Plus, there's a fun little twist here too because my goal is to make this skirt so that it can be worn and fully functioning at two different lengths. A shorter base skirt for a more casual everyday history bound and one at a full length true Edwardian style dress, but all in one garment. I think I'll also throw a little pattern review in here too, after having just made it twice, to give my take on the pattern's strengths and weaknesses. I'll jump right into the construction in a second, but first of all, a little disclaimer. Many of you know that I live in Montreal and it's said that the city has two seasons, winter and road work. And this right here is proof that we're officially in road work season. If you don't speak French, this translates to this. right outside my door, which also means that there will be slightly less in the moment commentary throughout this video because the audio quality on weekdays in here is just absolute garbage. So I'm sitting here nice and cozy on a Saturday morning, the workmen have gone home for the weekend, and I'll be walking you through most of the process like this. Starting out, the best part of making the same pattern twice, at least for me, is that you don't have to assemble anything or tape any papers together. So I just pulled out my pieces, easily recognizable by the superhero wrapping paper, and quickly realized that I didn't actually know what length I wanted the shorter base skirt to be, so I also pulled out my Kukliko skirt because I know I like the length on that one and I'll just reproduce it here. This skirt was a really nice project with the adjustable waistband making it super versatile, so if you haven't seen that video, I'll be sure to link it in the corner and the description box. Lining up the top edges of the two patterns, I saw that the length I wanted was basically exactly the bottom of the superhero print. Alright, easy enough, so I just pulled out my fabric and it's this lovely light blue chambray linen that I got last year in my warehouse tour and fabric haul, and even back then I had dog-eared it for a jumper dress, so I'm super excited to finally be making it. Even though the fabric was already washed and pressed last year, sitting in my sewing table for several months didn't exactly do it any favors, especially considering it's linen, so I reluctantly decided to do the responsible thing and re-iron it all back out. Also, my iron has pulled a bit of a Humpty Dumpty since the last video and no longer holds its water without leaking, so while I'll get another one eventually, in the meantime I'm using a spray bottle to achieve the same effect. Once it was all pressed flat, I spread it back out, and you can see it was basically the exact same width as my table, which if you haven't seen it already, I made the table from scratch last year using almost exclusively junk I pulled off the street, so if you're into elbow grease and power tools, all in the name of sewing, then it's a really fun video to watch too. I started laying the pattern pieces out on the fabric when I wondered if maybe I should fold the fabric in half to cut both layers at once and be a bit more efficient with my fabric layout. So I quickly measured the pattern pieces and the fabric and it looked like they might fit, but only with a centimeter or two left to spare. So I did my dance of indecision, then decided to save myself time and material and just fold the fabric in half, and if I needed to sacrifice a bit of length in the skirt to make it work, then that's what I'd do. Of course, once it was folded, it looked really short for a skirt, so I pulled out my Cuckleco pattern once more, verified that everything was fine, that it was actually long enough, and then started the placing, pinning, and cutting process.
To make sure that all the panels were at least roughly the same length, I marked the bottom of the wrapping paper on both edges, then added three centimeters and used the original bottom line of each panel to easily transfer over the curve of the hem. Once everything was cut out, I decided to serge all the long vertical edges of the panels since it was quick and clean and wouldn't leave any nasty raw edges to deal with. I had just found these cotton candy colored spools at my thrift store for a couple bucks each and this seemed like the perfect opportunity to use them. And I know that this machine looks like a complicated monster and like changing the threads out would be a complete nightmare, but here's a fun tip. If you cut off all the old threads near the spool, leaving a bit of a tail, then you can just tie your new threads onto that tail using a double knot so it doesn't come undone, and then you can just use the old thread to feed the new ones through. This works like an absolute charm, and if you tie a small enough knot, I have had it happen where I've been able to literally just tie my knots, then push the foot pedal and have all four new spools of thread seamlessly feed themselves through the entire machine. Even though I did play with the tension of the four threads a good deal before getting started, it still wasn't perfect, so there was a little bit of puckering on the edges, especially because these were all cut on the bias, but a quick pass on the iron really helped smooth everything out. Then, with everything surged and pressed, I hung them up overnight to stretch out, just in case that hem wanted to drop at all on these bias edges. And I just used a wooden pants hanger that I found at a garage sale. I think I got six of them for maybe two dollars or so, and they work really well for this application. Hello friends, good morning. I am finally coming to you alive and in the moment because today is the weekend. And weekends mean no construction, no dust, and lazy mornings in bed with the corgi and some coffee. Which means this is also a great time to introduce you to this week's sponsor, Brooklinen. Brooklinen is a luxury sheets company founded on the idea that people deserve simple, beautiful, and high quality home essentials at a fair price. As many of you already know, natural fibers are often praised and highly sought after when sewing clothing because they're breathable, they're durable, and they're really comfortable on your skin. And the same is true about Brooklinen's natural fiber sheets. I have their linen hardcore sheet bundle on my bed right now because it's summer and linen's natural moisture wicking properties make it even cooler than cotton, which meant that I woke up this morning feeling well rested and refreshed despite the summer heat. Their bundle is a great deal because it comes with a sheet set, duvet cover, and two extra pillowcases for up to 25% less than buying those same pieces individually. Because these sheets are 100% linen, they're not only light and breathable, but they'll actually get softer with each wash. They come in over 20 colors and patterns, which you can peruse from the comfort of your home. And I especially love that you can mix and match not only colors, but sizes too, because I have an extra large duvet. And in case that wasn't enough, this little touch right here absolutely tickled me far more than it had any right to. No more guessing which direction your fitted sheet goes on the mattress. Now, if you've been sewing for any amount of time, you're probably also familiar with the elevated price tag that often comes with purchasing natural fibers, and that's why Brooklinen strives to bring you high quality linens at an affordable price. Plus, right now, they're having their summer sale, which means all Brooklinen items are 20% off 
through July 5th. So if you want to stock up on some beautiful and affordable bedding essentials that will last you for literally years to come, now's the time to do it. You can click the link in the description below to add some Brooklinen sheets to your household. And now from bed linens to body linens, let's hop over to the other half of my bedroom and look at where we're at so far with the skirt. Okay, so here is the skirt. It's looking a little bit wrinkly because it was really windy this morning and it fell down, but that's fine. We'll just iron that all out. Hopefully it has had enough time to stretch out a bit. Plus I'll probably leave it hanging again overnight tonight to do any more stretching out it'll do. In the meantime, I did spend some time in bed this morning reading over the instructions for assembly, sort of just refreshing my brain on the process, and I had forgotten how many sort of tedious and fiddly steps there are in here. If you've been on the channel a while, you know that I don't genuinely take shortcuts and that I really enjoy the process of sewing. I like to be meticulous and precise, but I like to be precise when precision is demanded, when it feels like it's genuinely Really going to improve the outcome of the project and this it just seems to be a lot of extra steps for no reason or maybe for the sake of historical accuracy which is just not a priority for me personally so the instructions have you sew these main panels together then baste the box plates in open them up iron them down then baste them in place again then top stitch the pleat in place but with some extra fiddly instructions there as well it's just a lot of steps that, in my personal opinion, aren't necessary. I got a really clean finish on my Miss Frizzle skirt with just a combination of normal stitching and careful pinning, so that's what I'm going to repeat again, and I'll walk you through that a bit as I go through it myself. So first things first, nice and simple, we're just going to sew all of these panels together just like a regular skirt, and the best part about this pattern is there's not a single dart to be sewn. Oh, and I also spent a little bit of time this morning off camera cutting out um, some facings for the inside hem of this skirt just from the same fabric as the main skirt, but I figured it would be easier to do it now while all of the panels were still sort of individually floating and I could just trace them out onto my fabric instead of waiting for later when everything was all sewn together. So that's all done and we'll come back to these much later. So first things first, I took a second to lay all the panels out in the proper order and with the correct sides all facing up because there are a lot of panels to the skirt and they all look really similar. And even with my little labels on every piece, this still took some shuffling and double checking to make sure nothing was backwards or swapped with a neighboring panel. The next step, while the panels were still flat pieces of fabric, was to mark the box pleats. And I actually did this incorrectly at first, so let's take a look and learn from it. I had already marked the top of each pleat when I cut out the panels, so now I followed the directions to mark the bottom of each pleat. That part was correct and my technique worked well, but then I spaced out and just started connecting these two points with a straight line. And I did this on a couple panels before I thought, you know, something looked a bit off and realized that the line for the box pleat is actually supposed to run parallel to the outside edge of the skirt, following the shape of the hip. So I went back and used the original pattern piece to properly follow that curve and look at the difference that made. If I had kept the original incorrect line made by the ruler, my skirt would have probably been a couple inches too small by the time I finished sewing all those box pleats. Fortunately, these markings were made with a heat erasable pen so I could go in and easily remove the incorrect lines. Now I've heard of people having really mixed experiences with these pens, so I'll link the brand that I used in the description. They worked really well for me and I've used them on a few projects and I found them to be a real time saver. They're not a sewing essential at all by any means, but they can make the process go faster, especially in certain circumstances. Also, I've heard people warn that, oh, you know, be careful, the ink disappears with heat, but it'll come back in the cold and I actually tested that out and found it to be untrue. I had accidentally erased some markings on my corset from last month and I wanted to get those lines back, so I tried leaving the fabric in the freezer for several minutes and, well, nothing. 
So while I'd suggest always doing a little test sample on each fabric before you just start drawing away, my personal experience with these pens has been quite positive. Anyways, back to the project at hand. I redid all my box pleat markings the correct way, then all the panels could be pinned together and sewn up, taking care to make sure that everything was still in the correct order. I made sure to sew all these long seams going in the same direction, starting at the hem and sewing towards the waist to help reduce distortion and puckering. Then the seams were pressed, and the tailoring sausage came in handy yet again, making sure I could iron my seams without erasing my pen marks. If you want to add some silly tailoring meats into your sewing studio, I do sell kits for my ham and sausage on my coffee store, and that will be linked in the description as well. So I've gotten several of my skirt panels all joined together and the seams are all pressed just like a regular skirt. And now the instructions are telling us to take each panel and turn them back so that the right sides are touching and to stitch them together for the length of the box pleat following this black line that we marked earlier. And the instructions tell you to do this with a basting stitch. Now, generally, especially in historical sewing, a basting stitch is a really long running stitch that is often done by hand and frequently removed from the garment at a later date so it doesn't show. I will be doing none of this. I will be using a regular length stitch on my machine and that stitch will be staying there for all of eternity. So, Please do as you want. I promise I will not show up at your door and barge into your sewing studio and insist that you do it my way. I'm just here to tell you that both ways work. If you'd like to baste it by hand and remove it later, you are more than welcome to, but if you would like to save a little bit of time, I personally find it's not necessary and I will be doing it on the machine. So let's go do that. I'll show you how it's done. It's pretty easy and very fun. So the first step here is going to be sewing along the black lines that we just carefully marked. Make sure your fabric is right sides together and the two layers are nice and flat, then either baste that line or if you prefer to do it like me, you'll pin it instead and sew on the machine, stitching right on top of that line. Once again, we're stitching on this line, fabric right sides together, smoothing the fabric out, pinning and stitching. Once that's all done, you should have a series of box pleats or fabric tubes that look sort of like this, and you'll want to flatten the tube so that the serged seam on top lines up with the line of stitches you've just sewn. This is a little finicky, mainly because of the curves going over the hips, and I quickly learned it's nicer to start at the waist and work your way down towards the bottom of the pleat. I also started out pinning the pleats from the back, but then realized that doing it this way, the front side just wasn't always sitting as smooth as it should have. So this is me transferring the pins from the back to the front, and I'd recommend just pinning the box pleats down from the front to start with. See? Nice and flat. So then I did the top stitching and again veered slightly away from the instructions for the sake of simplicity. The historically accurate technique suggested is to sew two lines of stitches, one on either side of the main seam, and not to backstitch, but rather to leave a long tail, which you'll thread onto a needle to pull to the backside and finish by hand. Now, I didn't really want to take the time to do all of that, so instead I started at the waistband on one side of the seam, stitched down to the bottom of the box pleat, then took a couple stitches horizontally to the other side, and continued right back up towards the waistband. So instead of two separate lines of stitching, I was left with a tall and narrow U. Maybe not quite as historically accurate, but still very clean and way faster. 
Hello friends, same spot, new day. I promise it does kind of look like nothing has actually happened, but I swear much progress did in fact happen since last time we were here together chatting. So let's go through it. What I did yesterday was I spent so much time stitching all of these skirt panels together. My box pleats are all installed. They are top stitched down. Everything is looking nice and clean. The only thing that is not completely sewn together yet is the center back. So at the moment, the entire skirt can still be laid out flat as one panel. And that's because I'm going to wait to close that center back line until I have the skirt plaque it in. And I am anticipating that that is the one spot of this whole project that is the one spot in this whole project that is going to give me potentially some trouble because I did struggle with it in my Miss Frizzle cosplay. I thought I had followed the instructions correctly and then apparently I had not. So that is gonna take a little bit of time and that's not what I'm going to focus on today. Instead, today I'm going to focus on the bottom half of the skirt and the trim. So as you can see, I have been playing around with some trim designs here. I am quite happy with the placement and spacing and sizing of them. What I was not entirely in love with was the color of the trim and I'll really quickly run you through some of the options I had. Originally I was thinking I was going to be using this sort of light peachy beigey option but when I held that up against the skirt I was honestly quite underwhelmed with that option. So then I dug through my stash and came up with all of these various options that I thought could potentially work. Um, however, after going through them all and trying them out, did not and fully love them and settled on honestly kind of the most obvious boring option, which is just white. It is giving me um, very much Alice in Wonderland vibes, but I mean, as you can tell, it is a color combination that I'm a fan of. Uh, plus my roommate had a good point that it is much lighter and more airy and summertime than any of these darker colors that I have going on over here. So I think we're just gonna go with the plain white trim. But before I can sew that on, I need to tackle these hem facings that I cut out the other day. So I have decided that I'm going to sew the hem facings on first before I attach the trim and here is why. If I would sew the trim on first, then when I would go through and sew my hem facings, I would have to be super careful that the stitching for this didn't show through um, the white, that my needle didn't catch and pass all the way through the white and it would just be a much longer, more finicky and meticulous process. Whereas if I sew my hem facings on first, as long as the stitching that holds them down hits anywhere that's gonna be behind the white, I can just sew it on pretty, you know, willy-nilly, so to speak, and then know that when I go back through and put the white on, the white will hide all those stitches. So that is my order of operations. That is my goal for today. The end goal is going to be to get to the point where tonight, this evening, I can be sewing down all of the trim because we have started a very fun tradition, which is having a little girl's night um, in the evenings in front of the TV. Last night we did Miss Congeniality. Tonight, I think we're gonna be doing The Heat. We are apparently on a Sandra Bullock run and uh, uh, I'm not even mad about it. So it would be quite fun to be able to sit down and watch a movie tonight while doing some hand stitching on this trim. So that's the goal. Let's see if we can make it happen. I started off by leveling out the hem because there were a couple panels that needed trimming and then I went through and marked all the facing pieces so they'd be the exact length as their corresponding panel. This would ensure that the facing would sit nice and flat and give a smooth finish to the bottom edge of the skirt. Did it add an extra 20 minutes to the process? Yes, but having wrestled with ill-fitting facings in the past, I'd rather take the time now to make sure everything sits flat rather than deal with sloppy sewing later. The facing pieces were all stitched together, then pressed and pinned to the bottom edge of the skirt, matching up the seams of each panel on both layers, a process that was fast and painless because of the previous step. With the hem 
facing sewn down, I started making my own trim, and this was basically done by taking an old pillowcase and cutting strips of varying sizes down and making a sort of giant bias tape. Because I did in fact end up cutting this on a very slight bias, I had gone back and forth on whether I should make efficient use of my limited fabric and cut it on the straight of grain, or if I should make the tape itself sit smoothly on the curved hem and use the bias, and in the end I decided to cut it on a very gentle bias so I'd sort of have the best of both worlds. Then I measured where I wanted the trim to go on the skirt, playing around with spacing until it felt balanced, then I pinned it all down before our movie night began. Now if anyone's wondering how long it took me to sew this trim on by hand, one line of trim took me exactly 2 hours and 3 minutes. Needless to say, I didn't finish both lines of trim in one sitting, so the next day I did the second line and it was the perfect rainy day for sitting inside and doing some slow stitching. Once the trim was done, I could no longer procrastinate the part I was the least excited about, tackling that placket. Now, I don't normally have trouble with plackets, but something about this one, whether it was the way it was worded or the specific technique used, just gave me so many problems the first time around. So this time, I was determined to figure it out, and I did. But after much reading and rereading and staring off into space and brainstorming and shaking my head, so I'll just walk you through the proper way to do it so hopefully you can skip all those intermediate steps and just jump right to the correct method. It started off well, folding the placket in half, stitching it closed, and turning it right side out. Then marking the stitching line on the outside of the finished placket, as indicated on the pattern. So far so good, but the next part required considerable consultation of the instructions to make sure that I was placing the correct side of the placket on the correct side of the skirt, and there were some adjustments that had to be made, but finally I ended up with all my notches and stitch lines in the right place, and I could sew a first row of stitches close to the edge of the skirt. Now that the placket's sewed on with a small seam allowance, you fold it back and mark where you want your eyes to be so that they just barely extend past the stitching line. These were sewn on, and then I moved to the vent facing, which was attached to the opposite back panel of the skirt with the right sides together, and being sure to turn in the seam allowance at the bottom edge like you see here. The next step is not to finish off the other edges of the facing, but rather to sew the center back seam closed, starting right at the bottommost point of the placket and continuing down to the hem, although I actually did the opposite, which is why you'll see me finishing right at the bottom of the placket and working the hand wheel by hand to get as close as possible to the placket without actually sewing it. Then following the instructions, I placed the skirt on a table and folded the placket back to mark the positions of the eyes so I could stitch right on that line without hitting the eyes and breaking my needle. I did this by using two pins to transfer the location of the eyes from the front of the skirt to the back, and this worked really well. The instructions recommend that you either stitch this line by hand or with the hand wheel of the machine to prevent your needle from breaking, so that's exactly what I did. And here's what it looks like when that's done, with just the very tips of the eyes peeking out past the placket. Then the rest of the raw edges of the vent are turned in and stitched down by hand like so. Finally, it's time to sew the last box pleat, and this is your final opportunity to try on the skirt and make any adjustments to the waistline and the size of the box pleats. If the skirt turns out a little too tight, you can adjust the box pleat and make it smaller until it fits comfortably, and conversely, if it's too loose, you just make the box pleat a bit larger. And here the instructions tell you to sew the center back box pleat in the same way as described before, and I'm going to eat my words a bit about the basting being unnecessary because in this specific situation you do actually need to baste this box pleat to be able to get into the skirt, so you do really need to follow the instructions here for this one pleat specifically or else you're going to run into trouble. 
So I basted the box pleat, then ironed it down to make the fabric nice and crisp. And then I really relied on my notches here to fold the box pleat in half and very carefully stitch two lines of top stitching, one on either side of that basted seam. Do not sew horizontally across at the bottom of that basted seam like I did earlier, or again, you won't be able to fully open up your skirt to get into it. This was very tedious to pin and sew, especially making sure that I didn't catch the placket in the wrong side of the stitches, so I don't have any footage of it, but when it's done, it should look like this. Now for the waistband, I had a couple questions on the Miss Frizzle video about whether this pattern could be used to make just a skirt, and the answer is yes, but you might want to change the waistband. The original pattern uses a thin waistband and a separate facing because you need two layers to join the skirt and the torso of the jumper. But if you're making a standalone skirt, I'd recommend you make a much wider waistband that just folds in half like here. I'd also recommend interfacing that waistband, which isn't in the instructions, but it will probably significantly improve the durability of your skirt. This was attached in the usual method, pinning the waistband on, starting with the center front and working my way to the center back, making sure to pin down all the edges of the box pleats so they'd sit nice and flat. This is another place where basting is recommended in the instructions, but I chose to replace it with careful pinning and it worked in every pleat but one. That one just got picked and quickly re-sewn. waistband was folded over and I chose to stitch it to the inside by hand, but first I removed a lot of the excess bulk in the seam allowances left by all those box pleats and multiple layers of fabric. Also, am I the only one that in the final stages of sewing a skirt and trying it on multiple times does sew in my underwear? I can't possibly be the only one who's too lazy to keep putting my pants back on. Hit me up in the comments if you too can be found stitching in your underwear. Then the raw edge of the waistband was ironed under and while I was there I smoothed out the front side too so that everything would look extra sharp and crisp. Then the waistband was stitched down and the final steps were to attach the hooks that go with the eyes and I find this incredibly tedious so I didn't film it. So usually this is the part where I do a little post project wrap up to talk about how the skirt turned out and how I like the pattern before the final reveal. And you will get a final reveal in a second, I promise, but only of the shorter everyday wear version. If you wanna see the full length historically adequate add-on, and trust me, I think you do, because I don't think I've ever seen this method used before. Be sure to come back for next week's video. I'll also do my full review of this pattern at that point, because trust me, I do have some thoughts on this one. But for now, this video is getting quite long, so I'll just do my usual Patreon plug, and that is that if you enjoy the channel and you'd like even more Shannon Makes, I have a Patreon with monthly vlogs and some bonuses like occasional freebies, polls, that kind of stuff. And if you'd just like to give a one-time thank you, I also have a coffee account, which is where you can find my store with a small selection of patterns as well as my Taylor's ham and sausage kits. I'm mostly just sick of listening to myself talk at this point though, so let's jump to the final reveal. So this is what the skirt looks like at the moment. It's a super cute, very discreet history bound with a properly functioning and fully invisible placket that's great for everyday wear. Thank you so much for joining me this week and thanks once again to Brooke Linen. Don't forget to check out their summer sale and click the link in the description for 20% off your order.
Thanks for watching, and I'll catch you in my next video.